300,000 people and about 140 indigenous languages, Vanuatu has what's often said to be the highest linguistic density in the world, if you think about it per capita or by landmass or whatever, um, you know, compared to somewhere like Iceland, for example, which has a population slightly larger than that, an island nation, but with um, sort of one language there predominantly. But what's particularly interesting is that from the north to the south of the 65 or so inhabited islands of the archipelago of Vanuatu, there's really striking diversity in the structures of these languages. So Vanuatu's spoken languages are all members of the Oceanic language family, but a lot of them have diverged quite significantly from the ancestral language referred to as Proto-Oceanic. And this is for a number of reasons. It's partly because there's been in situ evolution in Vanuatu for over 3,000 years since people first arrived in the region. There have also been other waves of migration since then. And there's also been a lot of internal population movement, partly due to things like natural disasters, cyclones, volcanic eruptions, things like that, um, and also population displacement following colonization. It's sometimes been described as the Galapagos of language evolution. One of the things that's particularly interesting in terms of the diverse structures of Vanuatu's languages is that it has a range of complex and typologically uncommon features in the sound systems, amongst other um, levels of structure in the languages. And as Janet touched on in her talk yesterday, uh, these are generalizations that are made about oceanic languages, particularly with reference to Polynesian languages. So there's a consonant chart there for Hawaiian. Um, and so the kinds of structures we see in languages of Vanuatu are at odds with these kinds of generalizations that oceanic languages tend to have quite simple sound systems, but we do know that that's an oversimplification. Some of the kinds of interesting sounds that we find in languages of Vanuatu include bilabial trills, which are sound made a bit like this. Um, so these are sounds that are found um, not in all the world's languages, they're typologically uncommon sounds, uh, but they are found particularly in parts of Africa, Western and Central um, Africa, and also scattered in a few other places, particularly in a few places throughout Melanesia, including Vanuatu. So kind of interesting distributions here. Um, other sounds that we might find in Vanuatu include my slide, labial velar consonants. So these are consonants that are articulated with overlapping closure at both the lips and with the tongue dorsum um, at the velum. And these are sounds, again, that are not common in the world's languages. We do find them across sort of a, a swathe of uh, Central and Western Africa in a few other places. And again, we find them in a number of places throughout Melanesia, including Vanuatu. And so you might see on the MRI there the closure of the lips and the body of the tongue moving up at the same time. Uh, 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 uh. Some of the phonetics teaching videos. Um, other kinds of sounds that we might see. So I'm just going to see if I can get my slides here to match up with what's up there. Uh. <laughs> um, other sounds that we might find in Vanuatu are some that are extremely rare in the world's languages which include lingua labial consonants. So these are consonants where the tip of the tongue uh, comes up and touches the upper lip. So this is sound a bit like anna. I don't have a video for this one, anna. So you can see some still frames here, tracings of uh, this kind of consonant in the word nanat um, in the language vow, which is one of a few languages in Vanuatu on Malakula Island that has these kinds of sounds. Otherwise found only in a couple of languages of Southern and Central America, I think one in West Africa, but very rare kinds of sounds. But while documentation of Vanuatu's languages has increased a lot in recent years with a lot of large scale documentation projects and very rich corpora that have arisen from those, for a lot of languages, given that there are a lot of languages there, most of what we know is based on fairly limited written records of the sort that you might find in uh, Daryl Tryon's work from 1976, which has 
uh, word lists, about 250 items or so for lots of languages of what was then referred to as the New Hebrides. And for a lot of the languages, there are unresolved questions about aspects of the sound systems within the languages, also across the languages, thinking about the diversity of this region. There are a lot of question marks around the linguistic relationships between languages within Vanuatu. So they're usually described as being part of the Southern Oceanic linkage, but linkage, linkage. But the linguistic relationships within that have not been firmly established across um, the archipelago. There's a lot of question marks still. And so if we can know a little bit more and with a little bit more detail about some of the kinds of speech patterns in these languages, this can inform our understanding of the linguistic relationships within Vanuatu. But beyond that, closer exploration of the sound systems in regions like Vanuatu, which have very high levels of linguistic diversity and which have not received significant attention in terms of the study of their sound systems and many other aspects of the language, this can really add to our knowledge of the design space of spoken languages. So of the 7,000 or so spoken languages of the world, very few have received what we might consider to be comprehensive phonetic documentation. And so I don't just mean, you know, we've got a consonant chart and a vowel quadrilateral and we can see the IBA symbols that we're using for those, but actually thinking about, you know, how are the vowels implemented, what makes them different from one another within the system of the language, how are the consonants produced and what makes them distinct from one another, what are the prosodic patterns in the language, what evidence do we have for that? Really very few languages have got that level of documentation when it comes to the sound system. And it's very much the case that Indo-European languages have remained very firmly the focus of descriptive phonetics on the one hand, and then of course quantitative studies in areas such as language variation and change. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Efate region of central Vanuatu. So this is Efate Island and then some surrounding smaller islands um, nearby. There's been a bit of work looking at the linguistic relationships between the language varieties that are described for this region. Uh, on the map there that you can see on the right hand side, number 127 is a Polynesian outlier, a bit more distantly related, so we'll set that one aside for the time being. But I'm interested in particular in Nassan down the bottom, and then Eton, which is a little bit further up the east coast, the Leopard to the northwest, and then Nakanamanga, um, sort of across the northern part of the mainland and some of those northern islands as well, also referred to as North Efate and Muna. In some work by Ross Clark in 1985, uh, 1980, yes, uh, looking at sound patterns in these languages based on lexical data, it seems that there's really no clear boundaries between these language varieties and that the situation is one that's fairly complex and a bit more like some kind of dialect chain where you have Nakanamanga in the north as the most conservative variety and then this kind of core of an area of innovation in the south, southeast where um, Nassan and Enton are spoken. These language varieties all have quite similar segmental inventories if we're thinking of the consonants and vowels that are attested um, for the languages, but they have a range of other structural differences partly to do with particular sound changes that seem to have taken place. Since that work, there's been quite detailed documentation of some of these languages. So for the leper, there's a detailed grammar and set of corpus materials. For Nassan, a detailed grammar, dictionary, and a rich set of corpus materials. You've heard mention of Nassan a few times already across this event. And this is not partly just because Nick Thiebaud is in the room, but also partly because the availability of that corpus has meant it can be used for lots and lots of different things that have linked in with the work that's been taken place um, as part of CODAL. For Nakanamanga, there's a descriptive grammar from 1969 and some published text from the 80s. For Eton, very limited data, really just that try and word list and then a little bit of extra data from Clark's paper. Um, and then some unpublished field notes from Arthur Capel, which are available because they've been digitised and are accessible in Paradisex. So there's some uh, notes from Capel, there's also a handwritten translation of, uh, I think it's the Gospel of Luke by one Eddie Karras. These were probably documented in about 1960s or thereabouts. Um, but really not very much on that variety. Um, and so the work that I'm talking through really started with a focus on Nassan and it's kind of expanded to starting to look at some of these related language varieties. And this is work that's been taken, that has taken place with CODAL CIs, Jada Fletcher and Nick Teeboga, and then with other people involved in later stages of the project. So one of the questions we might have if we're thinking about the sound systems in particular is what are the basic building blocks of these languages? One of the aims has been to investigate and also provide evidence for the kinds of core consonant and vowel distinctions and prosodic patterns in Nassan and then uh, extending that to thinking about the related languages. So there's a few different ways that we could go about this. Uh, we could work closely with speakers to uh, target these kinds of things in our recitation, in discussing the ways that different sounds might, be, um, might differ from one another. 
If we look at the examples that are there on the slide for Nassan and Eton, which come from some of those previous written resources, we can see that the words for lapse and the word for to squeeze something are uh, written similarly. We might assume that they're pronounced the same way based on those available written records. But we've got a little explanation here from Jeremiah Karras, who's a speaker of the um, Eton language. So I'll just play that first and then explain it. Good. Good. No. Good way of launching me, Bulu. Excuse me, me, so no more. Good no more. So he's explaining that the word for, he's talking in this one, he's explaining that the word for louse, that's a sound where you have to pull it, that's a longer sound. But the word for to squeeze something, that one's just short. So he's kind of explaining that there's a difference in pronunciation here, and maybe he caught it when he was giving the example words as well. So we can do that kind of uh, detailed work, thinking about particular words and the ways they might be different. We can also try to collect controlled experimental phonetic data that really allows us to undertake targeted analyses of particular speech phenomena. So in this case, vowel length, and I've got a plot here showing vowel length for Nassan. So this is something that hadn't previously been attested for the language, but there are sort of hints that maybe there's something going on. And by being able to collect the right kind of data, where we're really controlling for the length of the words, the environment they're being produced in, in spoken language recordings, the kinds of consonants that occur either side of them, we can see an extremely clear pattern whereby we definitely have a distinction between five short vowels and five long vowels of similar vowel qualities. Uh, so this is based on data collected with various Nassan speakers. Um, so this is fairly convincing evidence that there is indeed a length distinction in Nassan for this data here. I'll just play you a little uh, sound file so you can hear the differences which comes from a different set of recordings to this particular study, but hopefully you can catch the differences. Seek, seek, fek, fek, tak, tak, so, so, puk, puk. And so those are all words which are minimal pairs in the language. So they're actual words that have this distinction between either a short or a long vowel. Another thing we might be interested in in thinking about the basic building blocks is uh, what are the differences between the consonants and how it is implemented. So thinking about a language where you might have a difference between sounds that are a bilabial, alveolar and velar plosive or a sort of P, T and K kind of sound, but then also a sound that's sort of a bit like a K and a bit like a P, these labial velar consonants where we have sort of elements of both kinds of articulations. One question we want to ask is what makes that sound different, what makes a labial velar sound different from a labial or a velar? How do we really know that those are different sounds? So we can look at things like voice onset time. So this is data for Narsan again. It has a single voiceless stop series, so there's no voicing contrast amongst the stops. We can see that for the bilabial, alveolar, and velar stops, so this is on the left-hand plot, and those first um, three consonants that are plotted there, we can see that these are sort of relatively unaspirated consonants. They have short voice onset times, and they are voiceless. But for the labial velar, which is the purple one on the right-hand side, that actually has a little bit of pre-voicing. Uh, this is interesting, it's one of the ways that it's distinguished from the other consonants, one of the ways that it's distinguished from the velar and the bilabial, and it's probably a little bit because these consonants are a little bit implosive, so you have a little bit of an implosive articulation that creates a little bit of voicing, but these are not fully voiced consonants at all, just a little bit. Or we might look at the closure duration, this is the plot on the right hand side, and we can see that that labial velar consonant is a little bit longer than the bilabial alveolar or velar consonant. So this is another characteristic that speakers might use to hear the difference between labial velars compared to bilabials or velars. In other data that's not shown here, we can also look at the way these different consonants are produced in different word positions. Um, and we can see that while we have very clear distinctions between the labial velar and the bilabial and velar in word initial position and syllable onsets in word medial positions in syllable onsets in word final positions in syllable coders actually they start to look a little bit more similar we start to get the labial velars looking a little bit more like bilabials because it looks like we have slightly different timing of the articulators and in fact it seems like for some speakers there is maybe a little bit of a merger happening here where the labial velars at the ends of words are becoming a little bit more like bilabials and there's a little bit of morphological evidence from other aspects of the language that suggest this has already happened in some words. 
we've established the basic building blocks, the kinds of consonants that are in the language, the kinds of vowels that are in the language, we, we might also be interested in how they combine together. And this is one of the interesting things about the languages of this Efrata region. There are a few things they do a little bit differently here. Um, they have phonotactic differences across the language in a number of ways, one of which is in the presence or absence of final vowels. So in that column on the right-hand side before the glosses, you can see some example words for Nakanamanga, which, as I mentioned, is the more conservative of these language varieties. And it's got these word final vowels that are also there in Proto-Oceanic, and Nakanamanga still hangs on to those. For the Lepo, in the next column across towards the left-hand side, these Lepo is smack bang in the middle of a sound change where it's losing these final vowels. And so this is something that was described in the 2014 grammar when I did um, some field work on this language, it was also the case then. It seems like it's something that older speakers will produce, especially in careful speech, but a lot of younger speakers are not producing these vowels, but have very good awareness of which word should have a final vowel and what that vowel is. So this is something quite interesting. Whereas for Nassan and Eton in those first two columns, these final vowels have been completely lost, probably quite a long time ago. Um, for Eton, there are not really a lot of records. For Nassan, there are digitized records going back quite a long time, early missionary works and things like that, and we don't really see much evidence of these final vowels. We also see interesting patterns of medial vowel deletion, where it looks like there are vowels in other places in the words that can be deleted. So again, for Nakanamanga, the rightmost column of data there, uh, we can see words like mataku, to be afraid, uh, which has that final vowel. It also has a vowel between the bilabial nasal and the alveolar plosive at the start. But for the lepo, nasan, eton, that's duck, and we've lost that vowel in between those two consonants towards the start of the word. Lots and lots of other examples like that, though there are some exceptions. But it's not totally clear exactly what's governing this pattern. Um, and this also gives rise to a lot of interesting, complex uh, onsets, a lot of consonant clusters that really go against the generalizations that are made about the ways languages typically organize their consonants when they string them together. So you have kind of sonority sequencing preferences um, that are quite commonly found in a lot of the languages, but this kind of all goes, all goes out the window when it comes to Nassan, kind of anything goes there. Not quite anything, but almost. Um, we're also interested in the prosodic patterns that might be found in these languages. So oceanic languages, as Janet mentioned uh, yesterday, are often described as having stress um, and as often having penultimate stress in particular. But lots of different prominence patterns are found across the oceanic language family. For Nassan, there were previous analyses which varied, including suggestions that it might have initial stress and other things. In data that we collected, we found very good evidence that it tends towards having right edge prominence at the last syllable of the word, and in fact not the word, but it looks much, much more like it's a phrasal prominence system. And then sort of establishing this allows us to then go and do more comprehensive analyses of prosody and of intonation, looking at how words are produced in different focus contexts and different utterance contexts, and we can see that there can be some shifting of the most prominent syllable, which again lends support to the idea that it might be more of a phrasal prominence rather than word based. So this is an interesting finding, particularly given how understudied prosody is for the oceanic language family. So, okay, well we can find out, you know, what do the vowels look like, what do the consonants look like, what are the prosodic patterns, what does this buy us? So once we have quantitative evidence for the segmental and prosodic patterns, this helps us to understand how these languages work as a system. So for example, for Nafsan, now that we know that there is a contrast between short and long vowels, and we know that there is a tendency for word, the syllables towards the right edge of a word or a phrase to be more prominent, we can see that where we have these uh, exceptions to this medial vowel deletion, so vowels that are sometimes deleted, sometimes not deleted in other environments, we can see that actually what's going on here is that the vowel deletion applies to only short vowels and not long vowels, and always in the penultimate syllable of a word, so the syllable that's before the most prominent syllable. So we can take that other evidence and it helps us to interpret other patterns that we can see. So the example on the right hand side there has some examples for um, itil or it tells. We put a suffix on the end that becomes itli and that medial vowel gets deleted once we've got that suffix on the end and that becomes the prominent syllable. But if we have a word like dol to pass and it has a long vowel, put the same suffix on the end, it's doli, it's not kli, it doesn't lose that vowel. So those long vowels hang around. There are also indications of different timing for some of the sound changes that have affected final compared to medial vowels. Uh, so for example, in Nassan and Eton, I said they sort of lost these final vowels a long time ago. It looks like in the Lepa, these final vowels probably hung around a bit longer. Instead, we lost the medial vowels beforehand. 
So for Nakanamang, we have, for example, a word for I. I'll play that because I've got the audio file here. Mama. And then apply to match. Um, and then we have the uh, Nasan example, which has lost the final vowel. This is the first uh, cell on the top left there. Mama. No, it's not. This will be the Nasan. No. Okay. And then we have the Lalepa example. Mama where it's lost the medial vowel and it's got a schwa on the end. So it's like it lost the middle vowel and then it really wants to get rid of that final vowel, but instead it's being reduced to a schwa. There's lots of really interesting vowel reduction that happens in a leper that doesn't seem to be characteristic of the other languages. And we see similar things for the word for nautilus there as well, where it's something like bamuke in Nakanamanga, bamuke in Asan on the left, but then bamuke in the lepa in the middle. Sometimes even a voiceless vowel. So this kind of careful, targeted work then gives us a solid foundation that we can build on to do larger scale investigations. And so there are rich archival language documentation collections that offer opportunities to extend the research on phonetic patterns across languages and within languages where access permissions allow this. The picture there is just showing some of the parody set collections um, in this part of the world. So as we've heard in a lot of previous talks, typical workflow is to have field recordings, undertake some transcription that's aligned to the audio there. A lot of this is available through the archival collections, sometimes for contemporary collections, sometimes for historical collections. And we can use this to undertake speech modelling and to do automated alignment of phone labels to the speech signal using, for example, the Montreal Force Aligner to save significant time on data processing and allow the creation of large phonetic databases. If you want to measure the duration of a vowel, you have to have a way of marking up where the vowel starts and ends. You can do this manually. That's going to take you a lifetime if you want to work with a corpus of you know, 50 hours of natural speech or something like that. So you need to find some ways to get to that next stage. But you do need to also have some good working hypotheses about what's there in the system. What are we actually working with? One of the challenges, and other people have touched on this, is the limited size, coverage, and sometimes the level of associated linguistic description for a lot of the corpora. This can be quite difficult to effectively develop language technologies. But if you have a carefully considered and linguistically informed approach, um, so we're not talking about just taking stuff out of the archive and kind of you know throwing some modeling at it and hoping for the best, but just kind of doing this in a fairly considered way, uh, we can get pretty good results for either a language-specific model, so we've done this for Nassan by itself, or a more of a pan-linguistic model, where if we don't have as much data for some of the related languages that do have similar segmental inventories, we can build more of a combined model that then gets quite good results across all of them. That then opens the door to all kinds of analyses, for example, of vowel quality. The plot there on the right-hand side shows vowel spaces for Nassan based on just about 1,300 vowel tokens in sort of careful, controlled, experimental-style data, which gives us very nice evidence that we have five contrasted vowel qualities. We can see the short and the long vowels there. But it's very reassuring that we also see a similar kind of vowel plot on the left-hand side, and this is for nearly 18,000 vowel tokens from data that has been uh, force aligned and has not been at this stage checked. And we see a similar pattern of five vowel qualities, a little bit of a difference in where the short and the long vowels sit relative to one another, which is not surprising for more spontaneous speech. <clears throat> so the point I sort of want to make with this is to say that if we can kind of dive into understanding the more fine-grained phonetic detail of speech sounds produced, as produced in these languages, the way they can be combined together, the prosodic patterns that overlay those, we can then continue to undertake comprehensive and nuanced analyses of speech patterns within these individual languages to learn more about their structures, and also across the languages to understand more about their linguistic relationships, potentially ways that languages may be in the process of changing, but also various kinds of sociolinguistic variation that may be present, for example, across the different speakers of different ages within some of these corpus materials. And these also help us to contribute more insights to phonetic and phonological typology with an emphasis on the phonetic typology here because I think there's a lot more we could still know about, you know, what does a P look like in lots of different languages. There's very little research in that area across, you know, very large numbers of representative languages. We can also start to think about what might be possible after this. So once we know a bit more about the pronunciation uh, in different languages of Vanuatu, different oceanic languages, we can start to think about how that might play out in the different accents that are found in Islamah, the Creole that's a lingua franca in Vanuatu, often spoken as an additional language for people with many different kinds of first languages. Um, it's often said that people have you know, different accents depending on what their other first language is or what island they're from in Vanuatu. 
We could also take, uh, undertake studies looking at how children might acquire the sound systems of Vanuatu's oceanic languages. I don't think there's ever been a study of the acquisition of labial velar consonants in any language that has those. How do children acquire the kind of precise control of timing that's need for, needed for those kinds of consonants? And another point I should have put here is that we could also find out more about how these kinds of speech sounds and patterns are perceived. Very little of that kind of research as well. So, I'll leave it there. I want to thank all the speakers of Nassan, the leper, Eton and Nakanamanga who contributed to this project either by working directly with me or with other people whose materials I've then been able to work with. Um, for Nassan, in particular, Artilingari and her daughter Ivana who hosted me. Uh, for the Lepa, Lesara, Kalotiti and family. Also for Nassan, Greg Kaltapau and Lionel Emil, who were very generous um, and, you know, very welcoming collaborators across the whole course of this project. And for Eton in particular, um, Eddie Karras, which is the same Eddie Karras from the early archival materials I was able to access from the 1960s, who's now in his 90s and still going and had a lot of time for me to work on this language. Um, thanks to collaborators uh, Janet Fletcher, Nick Tieberger, and Hal Stokes. I think I neglected to mention that the modelling is something that was really led by him as a collaborator on this project. And to Ben Wolchok, Coralie Cram, Thomas Powell Davies, and Kira Davy, who contributed to other bits of this project. I think I should stop there or be dragged off stage. Thanks. <laughs>